Well, the Supreme Court announced several new cases that they're taking up for the next term, and one of them is United States v. Scrimetti, which is a big one, because this case is going to determine whether or not states are allowed to ban gender-affirming health care for trans youth. Now, the legal question is whether or not these types of bans violate the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. And if you look at the text of the Equal Protection Clause, and precedent from this Supreme Court, precedent from 2020 specifically, I think it's a pretty easy question. These are unconstitutional, you know, but the problem is we have a conservative majority that's made it pretty clear that they couldn't care less about precedent. The question is, how far are they willing to go to defy precedent? Because if they defy precedent in this case, they're contradicting themselves. So it's complicated. I genuinely don't know which way they're going to hold, but we'll talk about all of that. But it is worrying to see them take it up because this is this is going to determine the future of trans health care for minors in this country for the foreseeable future. But even though it's worrying, this was kind of an inevitable result since 25 states now have laws restricting or banning gender affirming health care for minors. So it really was only a matter of time before one of these laws was challenged and appealed all the way up to the Supreme Court. And Tennessee's ban from last year happens to be the law that made it to the top. So that's where we're at right now. Now, aside from whether or not these types of bans at the state level are constitutional, there's another legal question here that's going to be determined. As Mark Joseph Stern explains, this major case obviously has huge implications for the rights of transgender minors, but it also gives SCOTUS an opportunity to decide whether anti-transgender discrimination is a form of sex discrimination that triggers heightened scrutiny under the Equal Protection Clause. Now, this is really important because this designation will determine determine how other courts interpret the Constitution with regard to trans rights. So if the Supreme Court determines that discrimination against trans people is also a form of sex discrimination, it is, then that would trigger intermediate or heightened scrutiny, which would require all other courts to apply a test determining first whether or not the law furthers an important government interest, and second, whether or not the law does so by means that are substantially related to said interest. Now, that's a lot of legal mumbo jumbo, but for those who don't really understand what that means, basically, it'll just be harder for states to pass anti-trans laws because they'll be more likely deemed unconstitutional. And that's important because there are a lot of laws across the country that discriminate against trans people. For example, as HuffPost explains, at least 24 states have laws barring transgender women and girls from competing in certain women's or girls' sports competitions. At least 11 states have adopted laws barring transgender girls and women from girls and women's bathrooms at public schools, and in some cases, other government facilities. Facilities. So when you factor in those bans along with the gender affirming care bans in 25 states, you begin to see how important and consequential United States v. Scrimetti is going to be. This case will profoundly impact trans rights for the foreseeable future. So what happens here matters a lot. Now, I'm going to throw a curveball at you. I'm not overly pessimistic about this case. Now, I have no faith in the Supreme Court, but the reason why I think it's actually a 50-50 chance that they side with trans people is because of the 2020 case of Bostock v. Clayton County. So in that case, the conservative majority on the Supreme Court stunned all of us in a 6-3 decision where they held that employment discrimination against LGBTQ plus people actually violated Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And Gorsuch and Roberts joined the liberals to protect queer people. In fact, Gorsuch wrote the majority opinion in this case, arguing, quote, an employer who fires an individual for being homosexual or transgender fires that person for traits or actions it would not have questioned in members of a different sex. He adds, sex plays a necessary and undisguisable role in the decision, exactly what Title VII forbids. Just to reiterate, Gorsuch wrote that. So you might be asking, wait, doesn't it sound like they already kind of figured out that discrimination against trans people is tantamount to discrimination on the basis of sex? And if you're asking that question, you'd be right. And since that case, lower courts have already been basically doing what they did there and saying, okay, yes, anti-trans laws, that is tantamount to sex-based discrimination, at least if they interpret the Constitution and that precedent fairly. But it's not so clear here whether or not 
uh, they're going to hold in that same way because, as Mark Joseph Stern points out, the Supreme Court, of course, found that anti-trans discrimination is a form of sex discrimination in Bostock. But that was in the context of the Civil Rights Act. It's very much unclear whether five justices would extend that principle to the constitutional context. Now, he continues, the textualist approach that led Gorsuch and Roberts to affirm transgender protection in Bostock will not necessarily carry over into the constitutional context. They may take a narrower view of the 14th Amendment than they took of Title VII. Since Bostock, many lower courts have applied Gorsuch's reasoning to the equal protection context, finding state-imposed discrimination against transgender people to be unconstitutional. Scrimetti gives SCOTUS a chance to affirm that approach, or perhaps more likely, walk it back. Yeah, so it's anyone's guess as to what they're going to do, but I will say that it would take a lot of legal mental gymnastics for both Gorsuch and Roberts to basically contradict themselves from just four years ago and say, actually, anti-trans discrimination isn't sex-based discrimination when it comes to the Equal Protection Clause. It's just sex-based discrimination when it comes to Title VII. That would be so stupid, and they would effectively be making themselves look stupid just to own trans people. And so if they do that, that would be bizarre. But are they willing to do that? Yeah, I think that they are. Now, when it comes to Amy Coney Barrett, we don't really know where she stands since she wasn't on the court when Bostock was decided. But if Roberts and Gorsuch apply the same rationale that they used in Bostock to Scrimetti, it really doesn't matter what Barrett does because with the three liberals, that's a 5-4 ruling in favor of trans rights. And honestly, it seems like it could go either way. And based on what legal experts are saying, there's mixed reactions. For example, Ellie Mistal is predicting that this case will be the Dobbs case for trans people, which was kind of my initial instinct. Alejandro Caraballo argues that she thinks asking for cert, which means just asking the Supreme Court to hear this case, you know, with this court is going to turn out to be a generationally bad strategic mistake akin to Bowers v. Hardwick. For those who don't know, Bowers v. Hardwick was the 1986 decision where the court effectively upheld bans on homosexuality. Now, that wasn't overturned until Lawrence v. Texas in 2000. But then on the opposite side, you have individuals like Chase Strangio of the ACLU saying that the ACLU, as well as other civil rights groups like Lambda Legal, felt like it was important to keep fighting all the way to the Supreme Court. Now, the downside, as Jessica Corbett of Common Dreams explains, is that even if trans rights prevails here, Tennessee's ban on gender affirming care will remain in effect until the court makes their decision. So trans youth will be denied gender affirming health care for at least another year which is deeply concerning because this is care that is life-saving and medically necessary. And it's important that I explain this every single time I talk about this because a lot of people still don't understand what gender-affirming healthcare for minors is. Because of right-wing propaganda, they hear gender-affirming healthcare and they think, oh, this means surgeries. No, for the most part, gender-affirming healthcare for trans youth just means that they're allowed to socially transition and wear clothing of the gender that they identify with and they use new pronouns and a name that they feel more comfortable with. For the most part, that's what it means. Now, puberty blockers come in later in order to delay puberty to give them more time to make a decision, and HRT is prescribed for adolescents with persistent gender dysphoria for years. This is something that can only be allowed with the consent of the parents. You know, right-wingers will tell you that teachers and doctors are going above the parents and they're prescribing HRT to trans kids. That is nonsensical. The kid cannot get that unless the parent consents. So this is a decision between the patient, the doctor, and the parent. Much like the issue of abortion, you don't necessarily have to agree with it, but you should acknowledge that making it illegal is going to cause problems. You're taking away health care from people that need it. Bottom surgery is not performed on minors. You have to be 18 to qualify for that. And even if you're 18, you still have to go through persistent therapy and get the approval of a doctor before they sign off on that, right? You can't just walk in on Tuesday and say, hey, I like my you know, bottom surgery and you get it on Wednesday. That's not how it works. Now, people think children are getting bottom surgery and that's why, for the most part, they are opposed to gender-affirming healthcare. And I, I think it's because the right has done a good job at associating gender-affirming healthcare with bottom surgery when that's propaganda. 
right? Now, there are instances where older trans teen boys are allowed to have double mastectomies, and some doctors permit this because if they went through a female puberty, then they've developed breasts, and older trans teen boys, they want to hide their breasts, so they wear binders all the time, which can be really uncomfortable and even painful. So, a doctor might permit it, and that instance with parental consent but that's something that's so rare and when i say rare we're talking about a couple hundred of those procedures performed across the country in one year right so this is not a decision that any of us should be making it doesn't matter if you support or oppose it this is a decision that doctors patients and parents have to make and yes there are risks associated with gender affirming healthcare, as is the case with all healthcare. but this is not a decision that any of us should be making so bans on gender affirming healthcare is politicians saying we know more than doctors. And as HRC points out, every single major medical organization, including the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Medical Association, the American Psychiatric Association, supports the provision of age appropriate gender affirming care for transgender and non-binary people. These organizations represent millions of doctors, researchers, and mental health professionals in the United States. Gender affirming care has always existed and isn't a new phenomenon. It's just that in recent years, extremist politicians have made it into an issue for their own self gain. Now, I'll link you to that page because they do answer a lot of other questions about this issue. And I, I know people don't know much about this, but that is going to give you a lot of data and studies and the opinion of experts if you do want to learn more. But at the end of the day, again, we're talking about healthcare that experts, not ideologues, have deemed as life-saving and medically necessary. So the fact that a court is even allowed to weigh in on what type of care a doctor is or isn't allowed to provide the, to patients, that's pretty ridiculous in and of itself. But unfortunately, that's where we're at. And the future of gender-affirming healthcare in America is going to be determined by this case, United States v. Scrimetti. And we might get a sense as to how the justices, in particular Gorsuch and Roberts, are going to rule once we hear oral arguments, which begin in the fall. But uh, until then, we don't really know. It kind of all just hangs in the balance. So this is going to be a really important case. And uh, I'll be sure to keep you all in the loop because I will be paying attention to this and following it very closely. I'm gay. Gays. Gays. Mom. I'm transgender. 